I'm still fairly bullish on offices. I think that, you know, uh, as you get out and uh, start re-engaging with people, as you get back to the office and start engaging with people, I think the experience of a lot of people is that they realize how much they've been missing. The COVID-19 pandemic changed our lives in many ways. Perhaps the most immediate change was forcing us to work from home. And for many, it was even the impetus they needed to change where they lived. The question then becomes, has this changed the real estate landscape for good and the way the investment world is perceiving it? Well, to answer this question, I speak with John Worth, Executive Vice President at Norit. Well, John, thank you very much indeed for taking some time to, to chat with us today. Let's talk about REITs in particular. Um, I mean, uh, obviously, I know what REITs are, but if you give us a bit of a refresher course for, for, for what they are and, uh, and how actually how that industry has changed over the last uh, five to 10 years. Absolutely. So, so REITs, real estate investment trusts, are simply companies that own and operate commercial real estate. Um, and so they're, they're publicly traded. They're, they're listed companies. They can be bought and sold like any other stock. Um, very importantly, uh, they, they are required to pay out uh, most of their taxable income in the form of a dividend. So they're, they're generally uh, good, strong yields and, and good income producers. Mm -hmm. uh, and they, they also, that also equalizes the tax treatment of uh, REITs versus holding, holding commercial real estate privately in a, right. in a partnership or in another form. So, so there's an equivalent tax treatment between the two of them. Um, in terms of you know, the, the REIT market and what's changed over the last five to 10 years, one of the, the most striking things has been uh, the increasing digitization of the real estate space in which REITs have really been, been in the lead. People think about commercial real estate as retail, mm -hmm. office, uh, and today those are of course still critical components. But when we look at the REIT market, you know, 40% of it is actually comprised by logistics facilities, mm -hmm. carrying out the last mile of e-commerce, data centers, cell phone towers, uh, there's also uh, healthcare, hotels, self-storage. It's a wide variety of, uh, of types of structures that make up really the, the built environment for today's economy. And how, how has that trend been changing and do you, do you see it continuing into the future? Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, as the U.S. economy continues to digitize, yeah. um, you know, we're, we've got to have a built environment that reflects the shape of that economy. And so, uh, you know, obviously, as we as we do more work remotely, as we spend more time on Zoom, as we spend time in the in the metaverse, perhaps, <laughs> <laughs> you know, that metaverse, just like the cloud, we used to say the cloud has to live somewhere. Yeah. The metaverse has to live somewhere. That's in a data center. Right. Uh, you know, as you transmit that to your phone or other mobile device, that you need a physical infrastructure to to accomplish that. That's what cell phone towers are doing. Uh, as you, as you participate in e-commerce. Those goods have to be fulfilled from somewhere, but but more importantly, you know, as as healthcare becomes a larger part of the economy, we need healthcare facilities. As uh, as uh, people need places to uh, you know to to put all the goods goods they've bought over the years, self storage becomes an important part. So so we have a and and retail and office will of course always be you know important parts of the built the built environment, and and REITs have have evolved to meet that, and I think are really on the front foot of that changing economy and right. have been changing very quickly along with the economy. The sort of de-urbanization which happened particularly with the pandemic, um, do you think that's a trend that continues? Did the pandemic accelerate something that was already gonna happen and people moving office spaces to sort of other cities outside of the coast and things like that? Yeah, I, th I think there's really <clears throat> two separate phenomena. Uh, you know, one is the work from home phenomena, and the other is sort of the deurbanization of living spaces that we saw sort of a burst of, especially in kind of the big gateway cities mm. early in the pandemic. Well, what we've seen is that uh, people have come back to the cities. Right. You know, and and I think a number of people who moved out. I think in, in retrospect, what we've seen is that they were probably going to leave in the next three or four years anyway. They were at that point in their life. Maybe they had kids. Maybe they're cooped up in an apartment. Right. And they needed to get out to the suburbs. This rings of, a lot of, of bells to me, of, by the way. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> they needed to get out to the suburbs eventually. So maybe they went two, three, four years early. Mm -hmm. uh, they've, you know, they've been backfilled with younger people who are excited to live in cities. And when we look at, at uh, 
occupancy rates for, for, uh, for apartments in, in the cities, they're back up. You know, work from home, I think, is going to be a different, a different event. Obviously, I think one of the things we've learned is that, uh, you know, we can work in, a, in more in a remote environment than we might have thought, of, thought about coming in. Mm -hmm. But I'm still fairly bullish on offices. I think that, you know, uh, as you get out and uh, start re-engaging with people, as you get back to the office and start engaging with people, I think the experience of a lot of people is that they realize how much they've been missing. Mm. And in particular, I think uh, you know, younger workers have really lost a lot during the pandemic from not engaging with their colleagues. And, and I think what we're going to see is that organizations are going to experiment with a lot of different structures of how to map their uh, work onto different types of spaces. Uh, but I'm, my experience makes me confident that offices are still going to be central to the work life. You know, they, the work life will not only occur in offices, but I, I'm confident offices are going to be central to the work life. Mm -hmm. So w w talking about REITs then, and uh, one of the topics we want to talk about today is the influence that um, digital assets and digital currencies will have on, on certain areas. Now, REITs strike me as a very sort of progressive product anyway. They're, they allow that uh, accessibility for smaller investors to get access to commercial real estate, whereas perhaps they couldn't have done by going out and buying a building. Um, so to what extent is, um, do digital assets have an effect on, on the REIT business, or do you think they will? Yeah, so, so let me just say, you're exactly right about the role of REITs, and that's, that is exactly why REITs were created in 1960 uh, by Congress, and, and, and it's why they've spread around the world. There's now 40 countries with, with REIT regimes around the world. And you know, in the US, 145 million Americans, about 44% of households, have REITs in their portfolios. So they're getting commercial real estate exposure in their retirement, typically in their retirement uh, accounts. And, uh, and that, that's very important, and, it's, and it, it just really shows the success of the model. So in terms of, of you know, other approaches to, to trying to sort of democratize the ownership of commercial real estate, we think those experiments are, are great, that the more people who can have access to commercial real estate, the better. But I would say I haven't seen a tokenized approach that works as well as REITs yet. Mm. Um, and, and similar, I'd say it's, it's sort of like, you know, we think the stock market works quite well for ownership of, of, uh, of public companies. And that, that's really what REITs are, are, are mm. there and that they're performing that role. So, I, you know, I don't want to say it's not broke so we don't have to fix it. I think innovation along these lines is great, but we have a system that's working extremely well and allowing uh, a large share of the population to get access to commercial real estate when they otherwise probably wouldn't mm -hmm. at a very low cost. So, I mean, a lot of other industries are thinking about how um, their asset classes would sit on blockchain, uh, whether it's commodities or stocks or shares or bonds. Do you think about in the real estate world how, you know, using Bitcoin or some of these other cryptocurrencies to buy commercial real estate, how that might work? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think you can have a tokenized commercial real estate. There are experiments with that. I think there's other versions of blockchain and blockchain technologies that can really help out in commercial real estate uh, in even more fundamental ways, right? So if you think about the role of titling and how long it takes to close on a property. I just think about the fees involved with a, a real estate transaction and, of a high. Absolutely. Know, personally. And, no, right. The <laughs> yeah. transaction costs and the closing <clears throat> costs uh, and the, the titling and, and understanding that. Uh, if you could get that into, it doesn't have to be a blockchain, but if you could get that into a, 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 a better set of, get that data better organized mm -hmm. and clarified, uh, you could reduce the transaction costs dramatically. And I think, I think that's a real opportunity. Right. Okay, sounds like a lot of efficiency possibilities there. Right. Um, now, talking about uh, ESG investing, which is another topic I wanted to cover with you, um, I know a lot of, of the larger pension funds maybe don't have a, an ESG mandate as, as yet, and there's lots of debate about whether America's going to start uh, particularly putting a price on carbon and carbon taxing. Um, can you talk a bit about the world of real estate and how that may be changing with the onset of ESG investing being a bigger theme? ESG uh, it has, has really you know, been embraced by uh, commercial real estate, especially REITs over the last five years. Mm. Today, uh, I, think, I think basically 98 of the 100 largest REITs put out, a, uh, put out an annual sustainability report. 
So they're, they're taking those steps to understanding what, they've, what is built into their current assets. Uh, and they've been taking a lot of steps to decarbonize their assets, you know, typically through energy efficiency, but also understanding climate risks and the climate risks uh, that, are, that are out there for their portfolio. And, you know, and it's not just about the E, right? Uh, governance is critically important. REITs have always had, I think, strong corporate governance, uh, in part because of this requirement to pay out the dividend. They sort of have a right. uh, historically provide a lot of shareholder control, but also in the social space, uh, improving diversity, equity, inclusion, uh, making sure that, that they are uh, both working with their communities and, and understanding what their communities need from them as responsible owners. It's, that has really become uh, sort of table stakes mm -hmm. in terms of going out to, uh, to public investors. You have to, today, if you want to be taken seriously, you, you have to right. have your reporting in order. And I think the, you know, what comes after reporting is, is more action. And, and that's what we expect to see over the over the coming years. So yeah, it, it's uh, it's really part of the part of the overall landscape right. today. Sounds like a progressive asset class already, to be honest. Yeah, I think I think that uh, you know, real real estate and commercial real estate. You know, obviously it houses the economy. Uh, so and when you house the economy, that makes you the source of a lot of emissions. Yeah. So yeah. you have to take it seriously, right. and you have to take start taking efficiency and your carbon footprint very seriously. Even though you know it's it's you know the activities that take place inside those buildings right. that create create the carbon, they got to happen. They got to happen somewhere. But they're happening in they're happening in the structures. So, John, I wanted to also ask you about uh, interest rates. Um, I know that's been uh, well, presumably a tailwind for the for the sector. Uh, but as you look out over the next five years, I presume you imagine interest rates will be going up rather than down. Um, how do you sort of prepare yourself for that? Onset, or, and, and is that what you think will happen? Yeah, I mean, I, I think we'll we'll see you know a normalization of monetary policy, and and you know both short and long rates rise. I would say you know uh, modestly over the short term, and we should see some reversion to a more uh, normal level. I'm not expecting us to get back to uh, to you know uh, a five percent right. treasury rate, but I, I could see us getting to two and a half, three percent, and I, I think. You know the impact on real estate and on asset valuations generally really uh, is dependent on on why rates are rising. Right. Right. So so yes, if we have an exogenous shock to rates, mm -hmm. um, that's not good for asset valuations. It's not good for real estate valuations. What we see historically when we look at the data is that um, and REITs are a good prism to look at commercial real estate generally through. What we see is that uh, you know in twelve month periods where where the ten-year treasury is rising, REITs actually have uh, positive returns about eighty-five percent of the time, um, and they they're basically a coin flip with broader stock markets in terms of in terms of which outperforms, and and what that's reflecting is that rising rates are telling us we're getting a strengthening economy, right. and that's flowing through through the operations of the the REIT into rents, into the bottom line income to the investors. So. You know, so we're we're always concerned about interest rates. Uh, we're concerned about uh, sort of these exogenous shocks that come from from a sharp change in monetary policy. Mm -hmm. But that's not something I see on the horizon. So you don't you don't get too concerned. I mean, there's a lot of talk about inflation right now, and you know, perhaps hidden inflation. Is it transitory or not? So that's not something that worries you just yet. You know, transitory has become sort of a bad word. You're supposed to put a dollar in the swear jar every time you use yeah. it. Uh, because I think that uh, a lot of economists, and maybe, maybe myself included, you know, we're, we're saying transitory without maybe being very clear about, you know, what, what transitory mean? meant. Uh, and, and to me, what that means is that we're not seeing uh, a wage price spiral. Mm -hmm. and, and I just do not see that on the horizon. I, I think we're going to see supply chain issues for the next, could be six months, it could be a year. Uh, we'll see what we've seen over the last really six months, which is that different assets, different different uh, sectors of the economy, we see increases in price as they work through a supply chain, but then supply and demand equilibrate, right? right. We don't see people buying used cars at historically high prices yeah. for months and months at a time. We see the quantity of cars demanded uh, fall dramatically um, and pr prices come down. So, and we're going to, you know, the lesson is really, you know, to stop an economy and then restart it, 
we're a big and complex economy. Mm. It's 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 a hard thing to do. Mm. Uh, we had to take dramatic steps, you know, in the in the interest of public health. Uh, but that is going to have real costs as you try to restart that economy. So um, so so my I have. Uh, you know, I, I'm very dovish in terms of inflation. I think that that we're not likely to see a wage price spiral where we're sitting here two years from today, talking about five and six percent inflation. I think right. this is very much uh, something we're we're working through, um, and that uh, you know we're going to get back to you know ordinary what we've come to believe was ordinary is you know two three percent inflation. Right. Uh, in the next year or so. Which, as you said, on the margin, probably doesn't make too much of a difference when it comes to real estate. I mean, real estate has has historically performed well during per periods of inflation. It's, yeah. it's often been thought of as, uh, you know, an inflation hedge. And yeah. and we find those effects in in REITs. When we look at, at periods of real inflation, going back to the 70s and, and, and 80s, uh, you know, we see that REITs outperformed the broader stock market during those periods because Still, a lot of leases have uh, have have uh, in, in inflation bump ups in them, um, and you know rents can reprice, you know either on a depending on the property sector on an annual, sometimes on a monthly, uh, and in the hotels on a daily basis. Uh, so you get a fair amount of uh, inflation protection built yeah. in. And very lastly, John, I just wanted to ask: We've been asking uh, a lot of people this. If we look out five years, um, what are going to be the main? issues that you think we'll be talking about in the world of real estate in, in five years time? You know, I, I think in five years, we're going to be we're going to be talking about uh, the increasing digitization of real estate mm. as the economy is increasingly digital. I think that that's something that, uh, you know, well, uh, I think people who are in the real estate industry understand this is taking place. A lot of people outside of it still view real estate as very much uh, you know, sort of brick and mortar, retail, office focused, mm -hmm. um, and the uh, the industry is changing very, very dramatically. The other thing I think that we're going to be talking about is, you know, just the increasing role of uh, decarbonization right. in a portfolio, and and you know, every portfolio I think is going to be judged based in part on its carbon footprint and whether we have explicit carbon pricing or regulation that that you know gets us some some way there. I think it, it's, uh, it's going to be part of the landscape that's going to be unavoidable. Well, John, it's been fascinating chatting with you. I just want to say thank you for your time. My pleasure. It's been a lot of fun. Thanks, John. Trying to predict markets is nothing short of Sisyphean. It's as futile as trying to predict the future. But luckily, that's not the goal of an investor. The goal of investing is to make the best asset selection based on the available information and the risk reward profile you are presented with and do that consistently. We don't know what the future holds, but by keeping up with what the experts are saying about the future of investing, well, that does give you edge. If you'd like to read more on the topic, please go to footsierussell.com forward slash research for more information.